we're live. Sorry. All right. Sorry, I realized my radio was up and even through my earphones, I could hear it. All right, so if we're all here, are we ready to begin? Michael? Yeah, we're good to go. We're good to go? All right, <clears throat> well, welcome everyone, good afternoon. We are here today to um, listen to Marie-Hélène Lesage's um, final architectural, Master of Architecture thesis uh, presentation, Defense, uh, titled An Architecture of Permanence. Um, Marie-Hélène's supervisor is uh, Leila Ferra, Professor Leila Ferra, second reader, Professor Masha Etkind. And we also have with us today, uh, Marco Polo, the associate chair of the graduate program, Master of Architecture program in our department. External reviewers, I'd like to um, welcome Dr. Elisa Deanesi, assist, um, assistant professor from Dalhousie University School of Architecture, and Joey Giaimo, principal of Giaimo. And it doesn't say Giaimo Architects, it's Giaimo. Some days it's Giaimo, some days it's Giaimo Architects. <laughs> <laughs> right. why, why limit yourself? Exactly. <laughs> well, you could be like chair. <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you all um maria ellen you've gone through this um a number of times before you know that there is a more or less a 20 minute uh, presentation um in time slot your presentation is pre-recorded which is very nice so we'll listen to that following which there will be um, an opportunity for our guests in particular to ask any questions for uh, clarification um, and if there are any, then Maria Lynn, of course, can answer those, following which it will be opened up for uh, commentary, feedback, and, and critique, starting off with our guests and finishing off with second reader and uh, supervisor. So, Maria Lynn, if you are ready, please, yeah. uh, please begin. Actually, okay. if, if, if I could just ask everyone before you begin, uh, everyone else, please turn on your mutes while the video is playing so we don't get feedback. Okay, thank you, Marco. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. My name is Marie-Hélène Lesage. This is my milestone for final presentation. Um, my presentation is pre-recorded, so I'm gonna play the video now. This thesis is titled An Architecture of Permanence. The notion of permanence has been defined by its material durability and physical endurance. However, Traditional approaches reject the acknowledgement of time and its effect in the built environment. They do not consider the realities of entropy and aging. To reconceptualize the notion, a renewed framework, which considered transformations and the passage of time is formulated in this thesis. This work is divided into three sections. The first one examines diverse approaches and perspectives on permanence. The second delves on the design inspiration, which was refined and organized into themes to guide this research. Finally, the last section presents the design proposal, which serves as a vehicle to explore permanence. Section one, multiple authors and architects have approached permanence through their work written and architectural. In order to establish a comprehensive understanding, this thesis revisits multiple perspectives. The belief that architecture is permanent originates from the legacies of antiquity. Historical monuments from this period are often associated with the notion. Bequests of powerful empires, they represent symbols of prosperity, wealth, and longevity. This belief also stems from the desire to leave a legacy. In many cultures and societies, people aspire to create something that will outlast them and leave a mark that says, we were here. Throughout history, Civilizations, political empires, and corporations have employed architecture to perpetuate power and permanence. The assumption that architecture is permanent also results from Vitruvius' concept of firmitas, an approach still referred to as a fundamental definition of contemporary theories. It represents architecture resistance to prolonged use and exposure to the natural elements. A building materiality contributes to a sense of permanence by its durability and defiance to gravity. Evidently, nothing lasts forever. Deterioration and decay are unavoidable through the process of weathering. As argued by Mustafavi and Letter Barrow, weathering enriches the material's experience of time and adds to a building completeness. In Alois Regal's perspective, the age value monument embraces erosion and aging as enhancement. Mages of decay and weathering challenge the notion of permanence. 
they strengthen the passage and the experience of time in a fast-moving world. However, a rejection of this experience has been central to the traditional approach of permanence. The avoidance of weathering and aging is embedded in the fear of death and time. Carson Harris argued that the act of building arises from the need to domesticate space. By constructing boundaries, humans seek to establish physical and psychological control. Architecture provides a defense against the terror of time. It acts as a coping mechanism against the anxiety of disappearance and human transience. The consideration of time and its significance challenges the conventional definitions of permanence and material durability. The work of Peter Zumthor explores permanence through the analysis of traces and remnants from the past. Architecture is not simply affected by the vestiges of construction, labor, and craftsmanship. Subject to life, it bears witness of vanished lives. Places and landscapes are historical documents that reveal evidence of past usage and inhabitation. A revisited understanding of permanence must integrate perspective of change. As illustrated by the Japanese ice temple, permanence can be embodied by cyclical rebirth as opposed to physical durability. Since the 700s, the shrine has been ceremonially reconstructed every 20 years. Through this ritual, building techniques and knowledge are passed to the next generation. The architecture is kept alive by the customs and traditions that surround and structure its existence. As it is admitted in the notion of time, permanence also expresses transformation and change. Jeremy Thiel argued that architecture is at all times marked by unfinishedness due to its transitory character. An architecture of permanence remains open to change even when complete. Employing the concept of the unfinished, Frederica Goffey discussed similarities in the St. Peter's Basilica plans and Scarpa work, the Castle Vecchio Museum. Rather than the result of unified visions by single creators, both projects reveal a plurality of voices that contribute to a richer and more complex story. Buildings as fabrics capture time as a cycle of continuity and succession. In an overwhelming culture of speed and performance, the pace of modern life represents a distracted unconsciousness between the body and the mind, as defined by Paul Virilio. As we rely on the built environment to support our activities and occupations, building retires to the background of our minds. Experienced on a mundane basis, they are rarely the focus of attention. Plasma argued that today's buildings do not integrate the dimension of time or the process of aging, rather, they aim for timeless perfection. Architecture can help us understand the dialectics of permanence and situate herself into the continuum of culture and time. It can embody a more defined and thoughtful spatial experience. Buildings and cities are museum of time, allowing us to understand change and the slow processes of history. Permanence was initially explored through a specific typology, monastic architecture. The analysis of the downside abbey in Tourette convent demonstrates how the monks' social order and their commitment to stability are reflected through the built complex. As discussed by Richard Irvine, monastic architecture represents an enduring unit of permanence in the world of transient movement. Following this research, another case study analysis explores six adaptive reuse monasteries with specific themes. The projects illustrate that, through various spatial qualities, material conditions, and references to the past, architecture has the capacity to remain meaningful despite being transformed over time. The investigation of monastic architecture allows the explorations of different ideas and principles from which emerges permanence. Section 2. Based on the conclusion from the literature review, research, and case study analysis, fundamental ideas were refined and organized into themes to guide this research. A revisited framework explores how permanence can be conveyed and supported. Composed of four sub-themes, this new approach was developed through model, drawings, and design exploration. The first theme is titled The Continuum of Time, conveyed by a connection with a shared history an architecture of permanence is composed of various layers of time. Reinforcing a consciousness of time passing, it enables individuals to recall the past, who they are, and where they come from. It allows one to understand the course of time and to participate in its continuum. The relation between permanence and the continuum of time is made visible and explicit through shared historical traces. Whether physically present or less perceptible, they connect people with marks of the past, demonstrating the passage of time. They engage with existing layers of history, 
resonating with practices and values of preceding societies. This subtheme was explored through a model, which presents the evolution of the Collège de Brebeuf former chapel. The layers, placed in chronological order, display the different architectural interventions, functions, and users of the space. The juxtaposition of materials and elements demonstrate the evolving practices and traditions of different groups. These historical traces are tangible evidence of a collective past. They bear witness of a community's history and reinforce an awareness of continuity. The second subtheme theme is titled Rap Temporalities, a concept inspired by a short fiction written by Johann Hebel and an expected reunion. Rap temporalities represent coexisting stories happening at different scales and time spans that will merge into a single lecture. By juxtaposing diverse perspectives and voices, it constructs a richer story. It allows one to develop personal connections within a collective history, helping one to situate its own presence into the continuum of time. The models are composed of two timelines, one subjective and personal, the other impersonal and historic. The models translate terms such as synchronicism and conflating into three abstracted methods, wrapping, weaving, and framing. Permanence is often preconceived as immutable and physically durable. It implies the encounters of idealized timelessness, unaffected by the innate temporality of life. Referring to the unfinished, this subtheme argues for an understanding of permanence that integrates perspective of change and transformation. The model, titled Evolution of Practices and Ritual, stands for questioning the role of permanence in transmitting intangible heritage through architecture. It consists of superimposed generic kitchen floor plans spanning the 1800s to today. Each layer represents distinct ideologies about domestic work, gender, the concept of home, and family from different periods of time. It emphasizes the unfinished character of architecture, embracing the dynamic evolution of living traditions. Instead of remaining in a frozen condition, built elements and materials are modified over time. Permanence is rather embodied by the rituals, values, and practices that surrounding their existence, which continue to sustain their significance. The unfinished was also explored through a series of small models titled Old and New. It investigates how tangible and intangible heritage is transformed through spatial and architectural expressions. Multiple combinations of old and new parts demonstrate how existing elements can be interpreted according to current ideologies while entering in a meaningful dialogue with past contexts. The unfinished demonstrate the ever-changing condition of architecture, acknowledging the passage of time. An architecture of permanence continues to engage users in its evolution and transformation. Rather than focusing on a sense of finality, it welcomes alteration, growth, and decays as valuable additions. Contrasting spatial conditions can support a sense of permanence. Divergent qualities of scale, light, mass, and enclosure can lead to a slower and more defined spatial experience, where one can engage with architecture in a more thoughtful way. The built environment can support a strengthened awareness of being present in space. As argued by Palasma, architecture has the capacity to concretize and ground us in the present time. It is our ability to slow down our own perception of reality and to transcend our understanding of time that reinforces permanence. Contrasting spatial conditions were explored through the notions of vastness and confinement. Moving from an expensive to a confined space brings consciousness to the body and the mind while strengthening its awareness to its surroundings. The notion of vastness was explored through the body's relationship with landscape elements. Water, sky, and land embody ideas of openness and extensiveness through their magnitude, proportion, and scale. The relationship between the body and the natural environment can generate diverse emotional responses, from euphoria to protection and intimacy, when confronted with the immensity of the world. The Salk Institute was analyzed as a significant case study that conveys permanence. The courtyard and its powerful connection with the ocean and the site's topography generate vastness and openness. Through light, scale, and material conditions, the architecture generates a grounded spatial experience for the users. In addition, six perspectives were designed to illustrate specific spatial conditions that raise one's spatial awareness and generate a sense of vastness. The drawings narrate an experiential journey through a fictional building and landscape. They explore the impact of landscape elements in confronting one's body's position and presence, 
against the built and natural environment. The notion of confinement was investigated through enclosures. Enclosure defined how spaces are organized, understood, and experienced. They enable the characterization and separation of human activities. While they can represent places of respect and refuge, they can also feel threatening and claustrophobic. Different types and degrees of enclosure were explored through a catalog approach. The drawings demonstrate how multiple architectural elements can impart a unique spatial experience. The degree or extent to which space is enclosed or open affects the relation of the body and space. For instance, a space enclosed on two or three sides provides refuge or anticipation, while a long and narrow space establishes direction and movement. Section 3. This exploration through specific themes led to the design proposal. Multiple sites in Quebec were identified to explore different conditions in which permanence can be conveyed and supported. After the analysis of potential location, an urban site was selected. It consists of the Lachine Canal's former flower dock, which is located in the Montreal Griffintown neighborhood. The Lachine Canal is a navigable waterway that stretches along Montreal's southwest portion. A gateway into the continent, this industrial corridor was one of Canada's main manufacturing centers. Along its banks lie a vast urban park with several vestiges and elements that testify to its rich history. Today, the canal remains partially undeveloped and fragmented since a global decline in the 1970s. Located in a Sudwest borough, Griffintown was once a residential, predominantly Irish, working class neighborhood. In 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway's opening led to the canal's closure and the decline of its population. Industries left, schools and churches closed their doors, and several residences were condemned or destroyed. Today, Multiple commercial and housing projects are being developed, and the neighborhood is experiencing a revival. The chosen site consists of the former flower dock located in the Peel Basin. Because of the presence of long barges that served to receive wheat and other cereals, they were called flower basins. Filled with earth and integrated into a vast green space in the 1970s, the docks and basin have resurfaced into the urban landscape after the excavation in 2001. This engaging site was selected to develop a detailed build proposal that integrates the themes of permanence. Currently unused, the former flower dock remains left behind in an uncertain condition, surrounded by the contemporary towers and imposing industrial structures. Stone ruins of the demolished warehouses are still appearing. Within the design proposal, these elements of historic importance were preserved and outlined through architectural and landscaping strategies. On the former flower dock, a revitalized urban park exhibits a new vegetation palette composed of planted and spontaneous species. The warehouse's ruins bear witness to the importance of the wheat trade for the canal's history. Preserved, they allow visitors to experience significant traces of a shared past. However, they will not remain in a frozen condition as vegetation will slowly take over the exposed surfaces. Inserted among the ruins, an elevated path stretches over the dock's length guiding the visitors through the bill's installations. The court and steel structure will erode and rust, witnessing human usage and the passage of time. The upper green pattern offers glimpses of the vegetation underneath, thriving at its own pace. Multiple roots stem from the main path, interlacing cultural artifacts. Alluding to Griffin Down in the Lachine Canal Pass, the narratives enrich a proposal with heterogeneous perspective. Resting in sailing platforms, are scattered throughout the site. Here, the visitor finds glimpses of beauty in unlikely places where the landscape carries the weight of history with a distinct character. The first installation is centered on the agricultural industries infrastructures. Native plants from the Canadian prairie landscape reinforce the significance of the grain and cereal industries for the canal history. Upon approaching, the visitors are welcomed by golden grass that surrounds a dark and confined entrance. The metal path stretches to the concrete slab edge, extending inside the building enclosure. The roughness of the reclaimed wood planks is softened by the flourishing courtyards. The climbing plants reveal through their leaves a series of portraits illuminated from above. Aligned with specific monuments, the collection displays several workers' photographs, bringing to life the vanished stories. 
On the south wall, tall openings divert the visitors away from the portraits and guide them towards narrow passageways. A steel structure borders each viewpoint, outlining the grand cathedrals of agricultural production, three windows frames, the silo number no. five, the ADM flour mill, the flashing Farine Five Rose signs, and the Cereal Foods Inc. silos. The second installation is centers on Griffintown Pass residence. Surrounding the built structure, the landscape reflects Irish flora since a majority of the working population was Irish immigrants. A portion of the brick used were salvaged from nearby demolished buildings. The material's rough texture, when hit by the light, reminds of human labor and craftsmanship. Following the path that extends inside the enclosure, the visitors discover a bright space illuminated by a skylight. The double roof brick wall become porous in certain areas as small openings punctuate the facade. Here and there, one can catch a glimpse of the rising condominium towers looming high on the canal banks. Long and discrete shelves are integrated into the masonry walls. They house a wide variety of cultural artifacts that belong to different decades, communities, and locations. Juxtaposed with views of the surroundings, the cultural artifacts narrate the neighborhood multiple narratives. A massive pivoting curtain steel gate marks the passage outside through the flourishing landscape. The path brings the visitors to the last installation, a viewing tower facing the canal. Here, the landscaping is composed of Quebec native plants that grow easily in disturbed and exposed soil. Metaphorically, they refer to the resilience and endurance of Griffintown's former residents, predominantly factory workers. The tall building is clad with reclaimed wood planks that will weather and further blend into the surrounding environment. The metal staircase acts as an extension of the path, leading the visitors to the second level. Slender gaps in the facade offer concealed views of the surrounding, letting diffuse light in the enclosure. Wrapped around a cable system, climbing plants slowly takes over the interior structure. Visitors arrive at a cantilever platform bordered by a steel framing box. Inside the observation terrace, the concrete slab descends and allows the visitors to be fully exposed to the landscape. Towering over the canal, it offers a sweeping views of the glimmering water, the river banks, the rising condominium towers, and its scattered industrial structures. Turning right, a long staircase which blends with the other installation directs the visitors to the site's furthest point and the last sequence of the journey. Here, several vegetation islands are integrated with eroded cobblestones a historical trace of the past still visible. Naturalized and introduced flora in Quebec animate the revived square, an assemblage of different materials, colors, and textures. A collection of metal tubes commemorates the countless shipping boats that have passed through the Peel Basin over the last centuries. They refer to the significant diversity of imported goods transported through the Lachine Canal. Combined with the last cultural artifact, it evokes an atmosphere bustling with activities from a long gone era. The proposal creates an ongoing dialogue with past, present, and future landscapes and narratives. The built installations and new landscaping conveys a sense of permanence for the users. It engages in an architectural journey of discovery, pause, and reminiscence. Hey, thank you, Maria Lynn. Thank you. Um, yeah. did, did you want to add something to uh, your presentation? Um, no, I'm going to pull up the PDF of that uh, presentation um, to okay. support the discussion. All right. <clears throat> so questions um, for clarification. Um, Elisa, Joey, anything that you would like to ask uh, Maria Lynn? Yeah. Can I? Yes, of course, please. Um, if you can go back to the plan, the main plan for the project, yeah. can you tell me again, I'm sorry, um, what are the ruins about? What, what's there? And uh, then how and why you decided to do what you did with those? Yeah, um, so this um, peninsula was 
used to receive wheat and cereals from the boats. Um, and then those two gray rectangle, um, these are the ruins of uh, those warehouses that were demolished in the 1970s. Um, and then after the whole area was excavated, um, the ruins are still uh, apparent. So um, they're not in perfect shape and vegetation has started to take over this, the dock surface. Um, and so in my design proposal, um, I chose to highlight their footprints and preserve their the ruins um, because I think it's important to it, it, it is important to out outline the um, the wheat trade um, industry for the canal history. And so I choose to highlight them in my proposal through architectural and landscaping strategies. So um, with the placement of the installations and the curtain steel path that goes in between and over the ruins, um, that's how I chose to uh, preserve them. Have you maybe used your theoretical models to do this? To decide, have you maybe used um, the models, your theoretical models to decide what was the best strategy? Or at this point, the models were one thing and the design model was something else. I'm just curious. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question, what models? You have beautiful models. I really like them about um, the shared historical oh, okay. uh, places, yeah. um, the rough temporalities. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mean, um, so in the design inspiration, the part, the section two of my thesis? Yeah, okay. These models, yeah. 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 Um, so while I was um, exploring what permanence is in architecture and I was trying to uh, formulate my own approach, I did a, a few models um, and then I used those from what I've learned through those models and those drawings. I've come up with those themes that help me um, create the design proposal. So for example, in this model, I explored the importance of elements that endure in time and that are preserved and modify over time. And so it composed this theme that I've called shared historical traces. Mm -hmm. And so my approach um, is formulated through those specific themes. Um, to revisit permanence. Okay. Just to carry on from uh, Elisa's question, so you have, um, you have the these, and I agree, they're very beautiful studies and models, um, and you have these layers that you're showing, and, and they seem to be layers of historical events um, uh, throughout time, and there's this kind of blurring. When you put them all together, there's this kind of blurring of these events to kind of create this whole new um, and very kind of distinct composition. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and I think this goes to uh, Elisa's questions: like, how do these, how do these translate to your final design? How, you know, how did you overlay your new design onto um, onto this kind of this strip, um, and how did it really influence you? And then for me, my what I'd like to add to that is. Um, how does how do the kind of the, the the tangible characteristics of the that kind of infill strip how do they other than kind of tracing out their 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 layout how do they really inform um, your design? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I start with um, this model, um, so this one represents the evolution of a, a particular space, and it was a project of adaptive view. So I was working with uh, tangible traces and so the layers um, highlights very architectural and tangible interventions that you can see when you remove uh, the transparent layers. Um, and so in my project, because I was working with, I'm going to go to the site plan. So since I was working with this almost bare surface, um, I look into traces that were not as uh, tangible or perceivable. So the ruins were one of these traces. Um, 
but I looked also into the, the influence of um, industrial architecture through uh, various structures that are still in the surroundings. Um, another trace was um, this influence by numerous groups of people that have uh, inhabit and work in the area. But since my project is, is not an, an adaptive use projects, I've, I've tried to work with those traces in a different way. Um, and so for the runes, I chose to conserve them because I think it's one of the, one of the, one of the important traits of the wheat uh, trait that is still visible on the dock. Um, those warehouses have been built and rebuilt since um, I think around the 1850s uh, on this peninsula. Um, and it, what remains is this kind of form that hasn't been really uh, preserved. Uh, so it kind of started to disappear with the vegetation. And so my goal wasn't, wasn't to keep them in this frozen state, but to just let them be on the dock. And um, with the path, people could walk around and observe them, but also see that um, they are evolve, evolving with the present context of my intervention. I think that it's what what is very interesting. There are very, there are several interesting points in what you you are presenting today. Um, if I look at this, I see the different layers overlapping, um, blurring into each other. The vegetation growing over something, um, but I, I mean, I don't see it from the drawing. Maybe right now, right? I need to ask you to understand where this comes from and how it connects with the th with your theoretical um, investigation in a way. So maybe it's only a matter of a representation, a, an axonometric view that could help to actually show this complexity, right? That doesn't exactly come out from the plan. Maybe it's also yeah. the screen. I apologize, I have a small computer. So <laughs> maybe it's my no, fault. No, um, no, no, I agree. I agree with that. I, I think what I'm, um, struggling with a little bit is there's there's a little there's some missing pieces here. I think an axo is definitely missing, sort of showing what you started with um, and what you're proposing, and then anything in between. Not unlike not unlike the kind of beautiful models that you developed. Like you could easily look at those models and understand what every layer is telling us. Um, and we want the architectural proposition to to show us the same thing and to tell us what each layer is doing, so that we can connect those layers and really, again, going back to my previous question, really show how the proposed design is being informed um, by the historical traces or by the kind of previous ruins. Uh, we're not seeing that here. Uh, it's, it's, you're sort of seeing it in the site plan, um, but really it just feels like it's a trace over what was there before. But again, going back to like the real tangible parts of the site, um, the, renderings, the renderings aren't helping either because the renderings are all developed out of a 3D model and they're all, they're, new, they're fresh renderings. There isn't an, again, there isn't an overlay with archival drawings or with the existing condition to kind of show us what's there. I, 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 I'm thinking now of your, your beautiful collage, like the, like the models were amazing, but your collages that you showed to help you kind of really understand the history of Griffintown and, um, and this canal. Um, I think they were, they were a great sort of, um, uh, you know, prelude into, into your proposition. Like there's so much happening here. There's so many kind of, you know, tales that you're telling us in the single image. Um, and I, I was expecting that, this to kind of carry forward um, into the proposition. I know it's there, it's there. Um, it's just the, right now, the, uh, the, the graphics and the, the way you're representing your proposition isn't showing um, the kind of real richness of the design. I could just jump in here for a second further to um, Elisa and Joey's comments. The site itself is a is a an artifact, is it not? I mean, it was in and of itself constructed. It didn't yeah, exist yeah. as a natural kind of thing. So picking this site is is actually, I think, very um, very interesting, and and supportive of your overall um, you know thesis sort of approach and study. Um, but I think it, it needs to be identified as being such. 
that, that the site itself, it's not a matter of, well, here's the site and here's the kind of stuff that people did on this site, but rather the site itself did not exist before. So it mm -hmm. in and right. of itself is a construct. Um, uh, and is it part of, you know, um, a permanent landscape architecture? Uh, but it certainly is a component of your story that, yeah. that I think you need to capture um, and not start mm -hmm. with a given and say, when well, here, you know, here's this, here's this, you know, pier, and this is how it was used. Um, before this pier, there was potentially nothing. You had similar things in, I think, in some previous presentations where, where there was an indication of sites that were constructed. And, and I think something like that would probably come in handy here. Mm -hmm. If you can You're find right. them, um, I'm sure you can find, you know, historical maps and plans that go back. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, mm -hmm. Elisa, Joey, um, any other questions for clarification? No. Okay. Uh, Masha or Leila, did you have um, anything to, uh, to ask uh, Maria Len at this point? Mm, not for clarification, no. Uh, we can have a discussion, but okay. clarity so, is, I think, is there. The clarity is clear. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so I would ask our um, our guests and Elisa, if you would like um, to to jump in and uh, provide Marie Ellen with your uh, feedback, insights, further to <clears throat> clarification. Sure. Well, I really enjoy reading the report first, and now seeing your presentation. I enjoy the fact that you investigate the possibility of architecture uh, going beyond historical preservation. And the fact that you question the relation between architecture, memory, and history, in a way. Um, you work on this idea of permanence, but you want to overcome the, its relation or the preconception uh, that it's related with uh, physical durability. But at the same time, you want to continue using the term. So maybe, um, I don't know, maybe it's me, but I would probably use something different at that point because it seems to me that you use permanence to mean permanent transformation, permanent change, something more like that. But that's me. I perfectly understand what you're trying to say. Um, so what, what's uh, interesting to me is especially when you talk about change, transformation, interpretation. So interpretation versus historical reconstruction. Um, and I think it's important at this point to um, maybe discuss a little bit about what's your idea about uh, history and memory. And um, I'm talking about this because you mentioned history as objective, um, memory as more subjective, um, but I'm not entirely sure if the tension between the two is, uh, is resolved or is expressed in, in all its uh, richness as it could uh, from your carrying from your research to your final project. Um, so the idea of memory as a fragment, uh, as something personal. And uh, you mentioned the fact that you want to be able to communicate to the next generations. So how do you communicate this idea uh, that comes out from memory? Uh, this, uh, how in you introduce the idea of collective memory, which is wonderful. Uh, but again, how to move it from a moment to another and how to move it from a generation to another. So how architecture can accommodate change, right? For me, a good starting point could be the diagram that you showed about the monk and um, it's mm, the daily activities that monks can do, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wonder if this could actually apply to a sort of um, to um, daily transformations in the park in your project, but also transformations that regards seasons, uh, decades, mm -hmm. and even, uh, I, I want to put this for, <laughs> for the next generations, even for, um, even when we talk about geological era, you have beautiful windows um, looking towards the landscape, it's an industrial landscape, but what, what can happen in 100 years from now? 
right? Since you're talking about permanence, I think you need to also question, challenge your own project and try to see what will happen mm -hmm. in the future, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. memory, Maybe. history, and this fact of how you, 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 you verify transformations over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I have. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, no, I was just gonna say that. Yeah, I've I've looked at transformations mainly through um, vegetation and how it would grow over time. But I think um, another step at for this project would 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 be to see um, how it would look in fifty years or a hundred years. But yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Um... So I just want to step back and congratulate you on uh, this work. It was, uh, you can tell from uh, your submission that um, it was a very long and very uh, like a rich process that you went through. I, I kind of admire that um, it wasn't a very tidy process. Like there isn't this, it wasn't this kind of carefully curated, um, carefully kind of curated process where um, everything kind of made sense from the beginning to the end. There were a number of moments where things kind of didn't make sense, and I, and as I was kind of reading through it, I was trying to understand, you know, directly how the kind of monastic research tied into your final piece. And it doesn't, it doesn't exactly tie in, and it doesn't have to. You're, there was a search there that was evident, um, and I think that that search and where you arrived at, um, I think I really kind of appreciate that part. I think you know, in all kind of thesis projects, that the process is so kind of critical. Um, and you know, I think sometimes even more critical than the than the final piece. Um, going back to your your thesis statement, which is you know how how permanence can be conveyed, supported uh, by considering transformations, passage of time through a renewed framework. I think I understand how um, I, I understand how um, that statement is coming through in the design proposition. But I think like Elisa, I'm struggling a little bit about um, about permanence and what your idea of permanence in, is, uh, because you're, 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 you're saying that you want to kind of uh, redefine or rethink this idea of permanence. Um, you're moving away from architecture and you're giving us, you know, you're giving us follies and you're giving us landscape, um, you're giving us landscape urbanism as a kind of discipline um, and you kind of shift away from architecture. So what does permanence, what is permanence to you? Is it, and is it the evolving landscape? Because Again, the final piece is showing us a snapshot of a very specific time. We don't know what that time is. Is it the landscape over five years? Is it the landscape over a hundred years? Um, and why are we only seeing a snapshot of it? Is this the ideal scenario? Um, then is this, this the permanence that you want to convey? Um, because the permanence for me, especially when it comes to landscape, it always like there's it's it's hard to sort of define. And landscape is always evolving and always flexible, unless it's very, very um, strictly curated um, and edited. Which I don't, I don't know if that's what I don't think that's what you're trying to kind of what you're trying to propose. Right. So um, the idea with the landscape is that although I've created you know some types of plans and how they would be arranged, the overall idea was that um, it would grow at its own pace and it would kind of take over in the more um, chaotic way than one that is uh, perfectly structured. So um, that's one way that I've tried to uh, translate permanence into landscape architecture. Um, in terms of, you know, strictly architecture, um, I have those three installations. Um, and um, I chose, I chose to build installation because um, Although I'm talking about change and things that are modified, I'm, I was also looking to build something that could uh, be more permanent and endure time, even though it could be modified, it could, st it could still become a new traces on site. So that's what the three installations represented. Um, so in a hundred years, did you see them going away? I mean, they are, you know, even though they come across as robust in scale, they're actually mm -hmm. somewhat delicate and probably not unlike you know the structures that were on this this strip before. Mm -hmm. So do yeah. you see these going away, being taken over by you know your your nature, 
or this constructive um, nature? Certainly. So I've tried to work with this connection with the landscape being integrated inside the enclosure. So they're all um, somehow not fully enclosed. Um, you know, there's no there's no doors, and some of them have you know like climbing plants, climbing plants that are taking over. So um, in 50 years, um, I see that uh, being first uh, modified by the landscaping, but also by human usage. So if they they don't feel as relevant by the next generation, yes, they could be modified and uh, transported and transformed for sure. Because this might be something similar to the temple scenario. Um, yes. That they wouldn't yes. necessarily be replicated, but something could evolve over time. Uh, Masha. Um, congratulations, Maria Lan. I think that um, my, my sense of your thesis is that it's a very rich journey that, you, that you're completing now. And I hope you're not finishing it. I hope you're continuing on it. And to me, the most important component of your discourse and your uh, research questioning, which was changing as you're moving along, if, as you were discovering new aspects of temporality versus permanence versus um, tangibility and non-tangibility of um, our, so to speak, made environment versus um, versus non-made environment. I think, Joey, limiting it to uh, landscape architecture is a mistake. Uh, I think it is uh, only landscape architecture because of the character of the site, because the site has no vegetation. So Maria Lan had to introduce vegeta vegetation and chose to introduce somewhat modest. Um, but I think it's relationship between man-made and environmental conditions between species, the rituals, the, um, Elisa, the uh, memory is um, somewhat uh, embedded in the discourse of um, ritual and meaningful, um, meaningful activities where the collective memory keeps it um, keeps it, if you wish, alive, or if not alive, um, aware of. Um, and to me, the most important aspect of your thesis is that uh, you kept yourself away from creating permanence. Um, because it's easy to build uh, a temple or a I don't know, you, you at some point were showing uh, some classical architecture, which normally we refer to as permanence, but really the perman permanence is in the environment. The permanence hopefully is in that uh, relationship between man-made and, and existing, uh, between memory and, um, and if you wish, uh, tectonics. So, to me, it was very important that you, as you, as Joe is absolutely right, it was a very uh, multidimensional path. And starting with the monastic architecture, which you thought was permanent, and as you moved on and discovered different aspects of human existence within that permanence, the permanence of simply durability, like Lisa called it. Um, what you discovered is that the permanence is in relationship in this balance between, and whether you put it on Lachine Canal or on the, uh, as we discussed earlier, the site on um, Toronto Harbor Front, it's in, that, it's in that balance of relationship that the permanence lays. And um, this, this tangible environment and non-tangible narrative, to me, that's what the real meaning of your thesis. And I congratulate you because it's not at all a superficial view of what heritage and what preservation and what memory and what collective memory and what history is. Congratulations, Maria. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, Masha. Leila, can we give you the final word, um, keeping an eye on, on time? Thank you. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you all for your constructive uh, feedback and thoughts and um, suggestions, which I greatly appreciate. Um, I think the research was quite interesting. And from the beginning, you were wondering what permanence was and questioning that. And um, and it's, it's a very complex uh, notion and how do we uh, address it? And I think uh, coming up with a framework like you have uh, with the continuing uh, continuum of time, uh, uh, historical traces, uh, rap temporalities unfinished and contrasting spaces with vastness and, uh, con and, ex um, and confinement. I think it's a very innovative way of thinking about, about it. It synthesizes, and that's what I appreciate, some of the readings, but also some of the explorations that you tried. Um, uh, so I really appreciate your uh, attitude uh, and your, um, your explorations, trying to see uh, what, uh, how to approach uh, permanence. So it, it's, uh, I think it's, it's quite um, uh, interesting and uh, um, refreshing. Uh, I also appreciate the quality of the, the, the drawings. Uh, in general, they are uh, clear and, uh, and of high quality, so I appreciate that. I very much agree with what the, uh, the comments of the, our two guests, thanks for coming, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, an axle would be helpful at the end to uh, synthesize. So I think it's very clear for you, me and Marsha, because we've been following you, uh, but it's really important that you hear uh, those who have uh, uh, just come today, read your report and, and heard your presentation, and uh, maybe by a final uh, axo or drawing or model or whatever you want, really uh, uh, synthesize uh, through uh, that uh, all of the complexity of how your framework has come together through this uh, exploration. I think that would be a very interesting exercise and uh, useful. Uh, overall, I really re enjoyed working with you. Thank you so much for uh, yeah this journey. I enjoyed Thank every you. part of it and. Um, Again, I appreciate the, uh, the synthesis aspect that perhaps through a drawing, a model could uh, be reinforced uh, towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I just want to say to um, uh, Julie's and Masha's comment, um, I started with monastic architecture um, a year ago and I've been you know, trying to synthesize um, all of these ideas that was I was interested in, and a lot of topics interested me. And I think that, um, uh, although I've synthesized permanence through, you know, four sub themes, um, I could have included more, but um, in the end, I've been trying to uh, condense and synthesize uh, um, this sort of sense or feeling of permanence that I've been looking for uh, through all of this work, um, through many iterations and experiments. Okay. Well, thank you so much to uh, to everyone. Um, Maria Len, we'll have to ask you to um, leave this meeting for now. Everybody else, please please stick around, and we will have our uh, our discussion. And following which, um, Leila Farrow will get back to you, uh, Maria Len, uh, individually, personally. Okay. Okay. So thank you again to everyone, and um, good afternoon to all the people who have joined us. <laughs>